was uh, teaching a, a lesson on the, the deity of Christ, if you remember that, and we spent several weeks going through and talking about Christ and the, and, and the, the not just uh, you know, a passage here or there that spoke to the deity of Christ, but more or less looking at the overall thrust of what Christ said about himself and how no man spoke with the authority, no man could speak with the authority with which Christ spoke with without being God himself. And no man could say the things that Christ said without being God. Well, anyways, towards the end of that study, one of the things uh, that I did, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 40. And one of the ways that uh, I wanted to, to end that study was uh, with this, looking at this verse in Psalms, but not so much the verse, but the whole Bible. Um, Psalm chapter 40. Verse number 7. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me. And that, that verse is uh, kind of hit me. It's one of those verses when you read it, the magnitude of it and the weight of the words just kind of hit you. And they, they, they just really left an impact on me. And when I got to thinking about that, uh, you know, we in, in the... In the study that we did, we looked at Christ's words about himself. We looked at what other scripture said about Christ. And we saw that all of scripture was a testimony of him. Well, what we did after that uh, was we started a, a study that's kind of an inch deep and a mile wide where we were looking at the pictures of Christ in every book of the Bible. And what I want to do tonight is hopefully try and finish that study that we started. After two weeks, we'd gotten down to, uh, we were at the book of uh, Zephaniah, is where we left off. Two weeks. I thought for sure, oh, within two weeks we'd be done with looking at all the books. We, we weren't even out of the Old Testament yet. Uh, so turn to the book of uh, Haggai. And uh, in Zephaniah, what we saw, so again, just to be clear, the purpose here is what we're looking at in the volume of the book speaks of me. What I want us to see is that the volume of the book speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ. The whole volume, from cover to cover, is a testament to Him. And it speaks of Him. And when you're reading it, you're reading His Word. And so what we're doing is, uh, it's kind of an interesting, fun little study, right, where we're looking at these pictures of Christ in every book of the Bible. So we left off uh, uh, in Haggai, in Zephaniah, we saw that in chapter 2, he was uh, the restorer of the remnant. I guess it would help if I got there as I was talking, right? Um, <clears throat> Zechariah, and the book before that. Haggai. And what you see there, turn with me to uh, chapter number 2. And in the, in, in, the, in the book of Haggai, I want you to see the picture that Christ is the, he's the word of the covenant. There's this picture of him being the word of the covenant. Chapter 2, verse 5 says, According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear not. In chapter 2, what we see is that the Lord is speaking through Haggai the prophet and he's reminding Israel, he's reminding her of her original glory. Okay, And then you get down there and you see that he's, he refers back to the covenant when they came out in the Exodus. So this covenant is the one that's being referenced back in Exodus chapter 34. And it's the old covenant, the covenant of the law and the, and the Ten Commandments. Um, so he's saying that I am the word of this covenant, okay? And then if you look at verse 7, he says, And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. First of all, I want you to see something dispensational. Turn to the book of Deuteronomy. Hold your place there in Haggai. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. 
Deuteronomy chapter number 28. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I tried to come up with a little jingle for the kids so that, that way they would remember it. And they came up with this little jingle and they got it down. They all got the first five books and then after that. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse, I'm looking for verse number one. It says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So he's telling Israel that if they obey his commandments, he's going to esteem their position. He's going to put Israel in a place of honor. And he's going to set them high above all nations. And back in Haggai, what you see in verse 7 there where it says, And I shall shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. What I want you to see there is that not only is Israel spoken of, but when you think about all nations in the Old Testament, there's this desire here. He's saying, now the desire of all nations shall come. So uh, all, all nations are going to be uh, submit. Every single nation on earth, not just Israel, but every nation is going to submit to the authority of God. Okay? So turn uh, back over to Psalm. Keep holding your place in Haggai because we'll move through the books. But turn to the, the book of Psalm. Uh, Psalm number uh, 86. Psalm 86. So I want you to see how all of these nations will submit, and we'll talk about the nations a little bit more when we get into some of the different books. But Psalm 86, verse 9 says, All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. You know, there's, uh, men thought that they were going to do it their own way, right? Ever, from, ever since the beginning, ever since God told them to go and to, to be fruitful and to multiply, and he told them to go, what did they do? They banded together and they, they made a city and they wanted to build a tower that would reach unto heaven. And ever since the beginning, they rebelled against God. They, they didn't want to submit to what God wanted them to do. But we're, what I want to show you here just briefly is the fact that God will take those nations and the ones who don't want to bow their knee before him, they will bow their knee. All nations will come before God and they will face their creator. Turn over to uh, Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter number 66. Now you'll notice when you flip there that Isaiah chapter 66 is the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. And it's kind of fitting that we have some of these concepts that, that, that are thrown in here. Isaiah 66 verse 18, For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Now there's an issue there with nations and tongues where God divided them up and he confused their language and sent them out. We won't get into all of that. But, but suffice it to say that he's going to gather those nations. They're all going to come. and They're all going to see the glory of God. And then if you look over at, uh, at Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Verse number 16 says, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Now, this is in the middle of a long statement that I'm trying to keep this short and simple and we're just touching on some things as we go through. But there is the point there, right? When, when we talk about gathering all the nations together, we realize the dispensational issue of the blessed position that Israel had and that in times past, God suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. But that will change. That will change. And there will come a time when he's going to gather these nations, they will, they will see God's glory. And when we consider that in, uh, in the context of what we're looking at in Haggai, notice that he said, he said that and the desire of all nations. You know, there is people who desire 
that justice, the righteousness. He's going to be the desire of all nations. Look over the last verse that we'll just look at here, Galatians chapter 3 real quick. Galatians chapter 3 verse number 8 says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And thee shall all nations be blessed. It's, it's so easy sometimes as uh, dispensationalists when we look at the scripture, we're so quick to make these divisions, right? And we always put, we always separate things and we're so quick to look at Israel's position and, and sometimes we overlook that fact that it was always God's plan to bless the nations and he always had that in mind. You know, in, in despite of, of, of the position of the nations in time past, that, that will change. But anyways, we have this picture in Haggai of, of Christ, uh, that he's going to be a blessing to all nations, that the desire of all nations will come, and he is the word of, co of the covenant and the desire of all nations. Turn over to Zechariah, the next book after Haggai. So if you go to Matthew and turn two books back, you'll be in Zechariah. And uh, I want you to look at Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. And in the book of Zechariah, there's a couple of prophecies that are, that are pretty clear, I think, uh, that we'll just trace through real briefly uh, in the, in see their New Testament fulfillment. Zechariah chapter 12, verse number 8 says, In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the Spirit, <coughs> I'm sorry, and pour upon the house of Jerusalem the Spirit of grace and supplication. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So not only is he pierced, but they lose a son. But not only do they lose the son, they're mourning in bitterness as is one of the firstborn. So God is speaking to Israel here, and he's, and, and, and he's saying of what's going to come, and there's a threefold prophecy right there in that verse of who Christ is and what's going to happen. So hold your place there, Zechariah. Turn over to John chapter 19. We're going to see the fulfillment of those prophecies there of who Christ is in the book of Zechariah real quickly. John chapter 19, verse number 34. John 19, 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw, and he that saw it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. What scripture should be fulfilled? That a bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So there's the piercing that goes on there. The other thing that Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10 mentions, not only the piercing, but that he's the only son. Look over to, to 1 John, the book of 1 John. First John, chapter 4, verse 9 says, and this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. So there's several verses in the Bible that talk about him being the only Son. He's the only begotten Son of God. And he was sent into the world to manifest God's love for mankind. And then turn to Colossians chapter 1. 
the third of those prophecies there from that one verse in Zechariah, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 18. says, and he is the head of the body. Now, the, the third one was talking about him being the firstborn, right? And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Why is he he's the firstborn? That in all things he might have the preeminence. We're talking about the volume of the book speaking of him. And in the book, it's placing Christ always in the place of of preeminence. Even in his death and suffering, he did it for you and I, and he's esteemed in what he did, even though he took upon uh, that lowly position. So he is the Messiah who would be pierced in the book of Zechariah. Also look at Zechariah chapter 13. It says in Zechariah 13 verse 1, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. And by the way, as a side point, you know, what, w- what, what was one of the purposes of baptism? Uh, and Tom's going to get into baptism, right? But there was a, there's a washing of water. Now that washing of water served many purposes and there's symbols in it. And I'm sure Tom's going to touch on all those. But when you think about it, when it says here, uh, Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness, you know what water does? It wash- washes away dirt. Water washes away dirt. So in your uncleanness, water is washing you, it's cleansing you, right? So there's this sense that, that Christ is going to be the cleansing of Israel. But uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. When you think about, it says, in that day, in that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David, a fountain You know, Moses struck the rock, water came out. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6 says, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that uh, that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. There's this fountain that's going to be made. Now, is this fountain dirty water? No. This, this, this water here is the water of life. Now, is this a literal water or is this the, the water of Christ? Is this partaking of Christ, the one who gives life? The bread of life, he's water, he's bread. All of these signs of things that give life, that give sustenance, that without these things we would not have life. So Christ is this overflowing abundance, that a fountain. It's an overabundance that, that springs forth. And one of the things when we were reading our hymn tonight, if you noticed, uh, the uh, hymn number 260. Did you request 260? Was that you? Yeah, yeah. It was the one that says, uh, All the way my Savior leads me. And on the last verse it says, Gushing from the rock before me, Lo, a spring of joy I see. How many hymns in this hymnal speak of a fountain, you know, something bursting forth, the water that's bursting forth? There's this picture in the Bible of, of, of water that gives life. And it runs through here as a, a picture of Christ as the one who gives life. It's very prominent in the way that, that we sing and we worship God and we have this imagery in our mind of that. So in the book of Zechariah, he's the pure son and the fountain opened to the house of David for sin. Now turn to the book of, of Malachi. The book of Malachi. And here in Malachi chapter 3, this is probably one that you're, you're probably familiar with. Malachi chapter 3, there's a messenger that prepares the way. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come saith the Lord of hosts. So he's going to send his messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. 
So he's going to come forth. There's this messenger that prepares his way, and he himself is the messenger of the covenant. Now you could look over at Matthew chapter 11, verse 10, where he talks about that he is the one, the messenger who, John, speaking of John the Baptist, the one who has come to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, in addition to this messenger coming, the one for whom the messenger prepares the way, he himself is the messenger of the covenant. And if you turn to Jeremiah, look at Jeremiah chapter 31. What covenant is it that he is the messenger of? Did he come? Did he come in the four Gospels preaching the gospel of the grace of God? Did he come preaching the message that Paul taught? What is this new covenant? You know, there are covenant theologians who say that there are basically two covenants in the Bible. There's the old and the new, and everybody's in one of the two. But in Jeremiah chapter 33... Uh, 31, sorry. Yeah, I wrote that down originally and had to change it. It's 31:33. 31:33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. So who's he making the covenant with? If, to be an Israelite, you have to be one of the 12 tribes, right? Now, which of the 12 tribes are you? And if you're not one of those, if you're a Gentile like me, not that even if you were Israel, it wouldn't do you any good today, but that because that program is not in operation. But you could see here specifically that he's making this covenant with Israel. And he says, After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So that whole time in the Old Testament, you had people who had put their faith in God who were keeping the law that God had given them. And they were struggling. What, what, what did uh, Peter call it in Acts chapter 15? You know, it's, a, it's a, a weight, it's a burden that neither us nor our fathers could bear. And these are people who loved God and earnestly sought and desired to please Him. But it, it's difficult in this flesh you know, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8, it's difficult to do the things we know that we ought to. It's difficult to do the things that we want to do. So what's God going to do for Israel? He's going to put his law in their hearts. No man will have need of a, uh, of a, no, uh, no man will have need of a teacher for his neighbor to teach him. God's going to write it in. They're going to be able to live the law and fulfill that law because God in the new covenant is going to put it in, put it in them. So he is the one, he is he himself the messenger of the covenant. The reason he's the messenger of the covenant is because he's the only one who has the ability to enact the covenant. Man does not have the ability to do it. So through what Christ does on the cross to be a propitiation for sin, he can therefore, by the death of the testator, he can then therefore enact a new covenant that allows Israel to have life. So he is the messenger of the old as well as the new covenant. And he's the one who gives that ability. If you, hopefully you held your place there in Malachi. If not, look right before Matthew. Malachi chapter 4. Um, it says in, in verse 2, But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now, has your Bible got a misspelling in, in yours like it does in mine? Does it spell yours S-U-N instead of S-S-O-N? I, I, I'm just joking, obviously. But, but notice, that's, that's not a lowercase s, is it? That's an that's a uppercase. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of of righteousness arise with healing. And, um, you know, there's much better people to comment on it than I. I think of, uh, what's his name, the farmer from Illinois? Morris Chestnut, that's right. And he, he relates a lot of things to farming. But when you think about the sun, what does the sun do? You know, if, if the clouds blocked out the sun, you know, if we had no sun, there could be no life on earth because there's, there's no source for energy and food couldn't grow and there, therefore we couldn't live. Sun gives life. It's a sustainer of life. 
it's there it's no coincidence that God uses the name that he the names that he does in the book to describe himself and so often you read through the book and you see that and you say oh yeah that's neat and then you sit there and you think about what that really means and and, and how God can convey so much meaning in so few words that the son of righteousness will arise He's the one that's going to come and he's going to give life through his righteousness as we see or we'll see in Romans, the book of Romans. Also, uh, verse number three in Malachi there. And ye shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. So in the book of Malachi, He's the one for whom the messenger prepares the way. He's the, he himself is the messenger of the covenant. He's the son, S-U-N, of righteousness. And he is the one who turns the wicked to ashes. All of those people crying out for justice, O oh Lord. Justice. Justice now. The Lord will deliver justice on this earth. Okay. Now we have concluded the Old Testament, and we've come to the New Testament. Now, either I have to go really fast to try and finish here, or we take our time. Uh, let's, let's just see as we go along, okay? Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. In Matthew chapter 2, in the book of Matthew, does anybody know how Christ is presented in the book of Matthew? Pop quiz. Didn't have a chance to study. In, in the book of Matthew, that's right, Rich said he's the king. He's the king of the Jews. Matthew chapter 2 says, uh, in verse number 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? So, if you go back up to verse 1, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So these wise men came, and what do they say? Do they say, hey, we saw a star, we're looking for a baby? Notice, they're called wise men for a reason. They had some wisdom, right? <laughs> they didn't just say, where, where, is, where is this person? Where is this baby? They said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? It's interesting. I, you know, I, I just thought about it right now, but when the boys did that recitation about, you know, uh, uh, what, what is it? Uh, what's the name of that recitation, Eli? Uh, uh, that's my king. That's the name of it. That's my king. And it starts out, you know, he's born, you know, he's uh, the king of the Jews. Well, one of the comments I made, and I was listening to the pastor out in San Diego who had initially preached the sermon, that somebody spliced his sermon up and, and, and made this thing about who our king is. And he made some, some very interesting comments, and he was talking about how, you know, you think about the kings of this world, and the kings of this world, you know, in order to become king, your father has to die. That no one's born king. And you know, I don't even think he was referring to this passage or thinking about it. But you're a prince. And when your father dies, then you become king. But our king was born king. And the wise men said, where is he that was born king of the Jews? Jesus Christ didn't inherit his kingdom or his kingship from an earthly king, from an earthly man. No, it's, it's his kingdom. It's his throne. It'll always be his throne. He was born king. He was born the king of the Jews. Now, go over to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse number 11 says, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Oh, you know, in, in this Sunday we're going to talk about governor, government. So here we have a governor here that, that Christ is talking to. Maybe we'll find our way back to this passage. But he says, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest, you, you said it. Look at then verse 37. And they set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. 
Now, don't you love it how they put that inscription over the cross? And you've heard it said, right, that the, that the Jews, the leader of the Jews, wanted them to, no, take that down. We want you to put up there that he said he was king of the Jews. You know, like it was a false it was a false statement that he made. It was a false claim that he made on his, path, on his behalf. Just put it up there that it was a false claim. But, you know, he takes the wise in their craftiness and somehow he's still labeled clearly for all the world to see that he is the king of the Jews and that was how he was crucified. All right. Turn over to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 10. All right, so you're one for one. And in the book of Mark, how, how is Christ pre uh, presented? In the book of Mark, let's, let's read the verse. Chapter 10 and verse number 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So in the book of Mark, you see that he's presented as, the, as a servant in his, his lowly ways and the way that he, he serves. And isn't it interesting when you think he's a king, he's the God of all creation. He deserved to be adorned with the finest jewels and crowns and to be placed upon a throne and for people to sub, you know, subject themselves to him. This is what he deserved. He, to be, he deserved to be served by all mankind. And yet, what happened with him? He came, made himself lowly, and served us, served Israel, but served all mankind by, by going to the cross, dying for us. That's a, that's a service paid to us, a debt that we can't repay. So he, he, was, he was made lowly, and you see the picture of him, that he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And he gave his life a ransom for many. Uh, Luke. Go to Luke chapter 2. First of all, in Luke chapter 2, we did this whole study and we were talking about the deity of Christ. And somebody had mentioned to me, and rightfully so, it seems like you know, we're always emphasizing the deity of Christ because we're always trying to make people see the deity of Christ and understand that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. He's God in the flesh. But sometimes we do that to the detriment of forgetting the fact that he is a man. And in Luke uh, chapter 2, we, for, we forget about, you know, the temptations that he went, to, went through, all of the things that he went through as, as a man and suffered as a man, and he knows the things, the trials that we go, to, go through. In verse 52 of Luke chapter 2, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Well, there's a couple of things I could say there about that verse. And not that that's necessarily the, the point of what we're trying to convey tonight, but don't you see there how that could destroy the theology of of the you know the reformers the calvinist theologians what's the one of the main things that the calvinist theologians cling to the immutability of god that god cannot change he never changes nothing ever changes and since nothing ever changes therefore he predetermined everything and it's all going to happen exactly as he predetermined right and but but there's a change not only not only did he increase in wisdom and knowledge, that's a change, right? He increased. But do you know the greatest change that ever occurred in the history of the world? The greatest thing that disproves, you know, the, the Calvinist position, the greatest change that ever occurred is that the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now there's a change there's a change within the Godhead. But anyways, that's for free. We'll move on. We'll, we'll think about. So Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, like a man does, right? When we study, we increase in, in knowledge. We don't all increase in wisdom. But, uh, you know, you, you get the point. There's, you, you see the, 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 his humanity there coming through 
in that verse. Um, but go to uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, oh, you're already there. Go to, go to verse 25. Verse 25 says, and here we're going to see how Christ is the consolation of Israel. The consolation of Israel. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for this. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, this was not the case with everybody in Israel, right? So the Holy Ghost comes upon him. And it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, can you imagine this man? It says he's, he's, um, he was just and devout. So the man being just and devout, you know that he's earnestly wanting to see this, right? Being a just man and a devout man, you want to see God. You want to see his things come to pass. You want to see these great things. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Lord, I'm ready to die. I've seen your consolation. For mine eyes, verse 30, for my, uh, mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. In Luke, we can see him as the man. We can see him. I also like to look at him as Israel's consolation that's coming to Israel, what they were earnestly expecting, or what they earnestly should have been expecting, and what some of them in reality were. Now, if you turn over to the book of John, The book of John. I, I don't know why, but it, it seems to me that uh, sometimes when I, uh, more often than not, it seems like I wind up coming to the first chapter of John in some way or another when I'm thinking about things or when I'm teaching about things. The first chapter of John is, is a beautiful passage. Obviously, it talks about uh, so many things about who Christ is, talking about the deity of Christ. But in John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we know that the Word was God himself, and we know later on that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So therefore, using our detective skills, who is the Word? We know that the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ who took upon a fleshly tabernacle, who tabernacled among us in this earthly flesh and an earthly body, and he, became, he was God who took upon himself the, the, the form of flesh. So we know that, that the Word was God. We know that Christ is God. So he's the creator. And then look at over in um, uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. You know, obviously, the volume of the book speaks of him, and there's, there's many other references that could have been used, uh, you know, in, in, in seeing Christ in these books. I tried to limit myself. I was originally wanting to do one, and then I said, okay, no more than two. Then sometimes that went to three, but no, 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 two, two. So John chapter 8, verse, uh, verse I want verse 52. John 8, verse 52. Then said the Jews unto him, now the Jews, they didn't like him very much, right? And the leaders were always trying to trip him up. So the Jews, uh, you know, they're coming to Jesus. They're going to they're gonna try to catch him up in something. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. Then they said unto, I'm sorry. Then said Jesus, the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead. And the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, 
I shall be a liar like unto you. Oh, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty pointed, right? That one hurts. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And then they took up stones to cast at him because they wanted to kill him. Because when Jesus said that, they knew what he was claiming. Because, he, 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 you know, it would be one thing to say, Before Abraham was, I was. Right? Because then... Then, you know, if you think about it on a timeline, like you can have a little dot where the time starts. Okay, here's Abraham. Before Abraham was, I was. You could say, well, okay, he began back here. Now, still, they'd have a problem with that, right? But he doesn't say, I was. He says, I am. I am that I am. Who are you? I am. So uh, he catches them up, and eventually they learn their lesson, and eventually they never come back to ask him another question again. All right, so in the book of John, you know, there's some other things. He's the, he's the only begotten son, which we already saw. He's the lamb of God. He's the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He's the door of the sheep. He's the good shepherd, the resurrection and life, the way, the truth, the life, and he's the true vine. But in John, we went over the fact that he is the creator God, the word himself, and he is, I am. My father-in-law sings a song uh, that was sung by the Marksmen, and maybe if Jim was here, he might know who the Marksmen are. They're you know, bluegrass gospel group, but the song is, He is, I am. And it's, a, it's a beautiful song. Um, anyways, uh, the, book of, the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 13. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 13. So he is, uh, look at verse number 28, no, 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. So Paul is preaching here, uh, he, he, in, in Acts 13, um, you know, he's going and he goes to the synagogues first, right? And then there's other Gentiles that are around. They're hearing the message. The message is being sent out. When Paul starts preaching, you know, he's, he's, he's preaching something that, hey, this message is being sent to you. And so in Acts, in, in a sense, if you look at verse uh, 38 real quick, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that's not Paul, and he's not... He's not talking about through Peter it's being preached. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who died for them, was resurrected. He says, And be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. So Christ is the one who gives the ability for mankind, for you and I, to present this gospel message to other people. So in the book of Acts, we see Christ as the one who gives the power of the gospel, the one through whom is preached the forgiveness of sins. And then uh, let's, let's look at one more. Acts and Acts. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Two twenty three says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and for now who is this speaking right now we know now in Acts chapter two, we're back under the kingdom program where we, we're listening to Peter preach, and Peter's audience is Israel, and he says in Acts chapter two and verse twenty three, he's 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 really, really giving it to the Jews, and he's really giving it to his brethren who had just crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's letting them know who he was, and he says him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Look at verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Flip over to verse, uh, chapter 4 real quick. Verse number 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. So there's the power of Christ. He is the crucified one. He is the one whom Israel, whom they took. Rome helped. The Gentiles helped. Israel wanted it done. But Christ is the crucified one. And the fact of that crucifixion is it gives us the ability to preach that gospel or it gives us the ability to, to preach the gospel of the grace of God. The fact that Christ died for our sins and when you put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins and what he did and what he did exclusively, then you can experience salvation for yourself and you can have your life change. You go from death to life and all of that is made possible by Jesus Christ. And and the fact is, folks, that when you read this book, it's all a testament to him. It's all a testament to him. The volume of the book speaks of him, and you can't get away from it. You can't, you can't, live, uh, you know, you can't live without him. You'll, you will not have life without him. And the only key to life is found in the pages of this book. There's no other book like it. It's, there's no other book like it at all, and it all speaks of him. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to come together uh, in this country, Lord, to, to study your word. And we thank you, Lord, for other people, other like-minded believers that uh, have an interest in your word, Lord, that want, that want to know it. Lord, most of all, we're thankful for what you've done for us, realizing that... Uh, you know, you, you gave your only son the thing that you loved most, the thing that was most dear to you, um, and that he died for us, that it wasn't something easy, Lord, but as a man in the flesh, uh, he was pierced, he was beaten, he was whipped, and he suffered all of that only for the simple fact, no benefit to himself, but only because he loved us. Lord, help us to see that, help us to humble ourselves before you, and uh, help us to use that love that he had for us to motivate us to love others enough to tell them about this message. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.